on behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia Series and our sponsor, Elsevier, I'd like to welcome you to Optimizing Personalized Drug Dosing for Patients with Drug-Specific Pharmacokinetic Data Models. My name is Elizabeth Lamb, and I'm the host and technical director for today's event. Now, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. We have Olivier Barberon, Ph.D., Director for Translational Medicine at Elsevier. Fabien Astic, INSEAD, MBA, Co-Founder, Business Development at Exact Cure. Aurelie Laraclou, Research Engineer and PhD student at Exact Cure. And our final presenter is Thomas Varg, PhD, Product Manager, Pharmapendium Elsevier. Welcome to all of our presenters, and Dr. Barbaron, the presenter ball is yours. Thanks, Elizabeth, for this uh, kind introduction of all the, the presenters. So, yeah, today I would like to, to discuss with you guys, and uh, really uh, don't be shy at the end. You, are, you need to ask questions through the chat, that uh, all these questions will be answered, as Elizabeth said, by email or directly at the end of the of the presentation. So today we will have to touch this uh, optimizing personalized drug dosing for patients with uh, drug-specific pharmacokinetic data models. And we are four pre presenters for that one because this is a collaboration between Elsevier and uh, our partners Exacture in that one. And I would like to show you what we have done so far. Of course, this is not the end of the, the story and uh, we would like, we, we will be very happy to work with you if you need this type of, uh, I would say, pharmacokinetic uh, personalized drug dosing for, for your project. And this is something that we can share at the end of the, of the meeting also. I would say the, the difference between the patients using the genders, uh, the communications, et cetera, that will influence the pharmacokinetic of a drug. Of course, the, the dosing is often standardized for a certain population. So this is something that we'll see afterwards. And uh, most of the time we are not we are ignoring a bit the, the individual patients in the background. Of course, we are seeing the, the, the PK for different group of people, but are we able to predict what will happen to a, a patient itself? Uh, so, uh, the, of course, this uh, type of, uh, I would say, PK modeling or this, uh, this uh, experiment that are done during the phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials, um, they are always done on a population that is not really the, the, the real population that will be touched at the end by the by the product. So this is why most of the time we are seeing uh, some uh, dangerous adverse event or, or something like that that are popping up in the when the, the, the drug is really on the on the market, when the drug is touching the real world population. And this is what this is something that we, we saw many times during the, the development of a drug uh, when, the, when we are talking with customers and this is what we want to I would say to solve, not to solve, but at least that we want to touch with, with Exacture together uh, to work on this uh, personalized drug dosing for patients using the data that are coming from uh, Elsevier and the technology that was developed by Exacture in this case. So uh, this model will be, of course, uh, a drug specific, but also a really patient specific. And you will see three examples that will be uh, disclosed by uh, our colleagues uh, already in this case. So uh, just to, to, to go back a bit on uh, what does it mean uh, patients and what does it mean efficacy and safety there. So when we are trying to optimize a drug, uh, a dosing for a drug, uh, most of the time this is always a balance between uh, which, which dose we should use to, to, be, to have an efficacy of the drug and also to be as safe as possible. And this is always the, 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 the tricky part. So if you are if you have a, a dose that is too low, in this case, you will be with the, I would say, the, the, the blue curve, uh, meaning that will be under the efficacy part of the drug. And if you are too high, you will reach some adverse event or multiple adverse event. And this is what uh, what we want to avoid, of course. So you need to be in between. And this in between, it's also dependent on, on the patient for sure. And when, we, when you look into the, the next steps, that is how the drug are developed. So you know that very well. So phase one, phase two, phase three. Uh, there is different type of size of population during the phase one, phase two, and phase three. And of course, the, 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 the pharma companies, they are trying to develop as much as possible uh, the drug to, to, to have a, an efficacy, of course, and also to, to avoid as much as possible the adverse event. But uh, as we said at the beginning, there, this is very, very difficult to have a, a large amount of uh, 
a large population because in phase three, for example, there is no way to have more than five to 10,000 people, max, 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 most of the time. And this is very difficult to touch all the different uh, population or patients and also the different communication that the people are taking uh, during the during the direct development there. So this is this is why we are seeing this type of adverse event. And this is why at least the, the dose is always standardized to be uh, used by the maximum of people, but we are uh, a bit losing the, the track that uh, this dose should be uh, normally, uh, I would say, individualized or have a personalized dose for every every people. So if you look into the, the how the, the dose is mainly mentioned in the label, so this is a label that was extracted from Farapenium there. What are the, the, what is the dosing recommendation that we have for that one? It's very, it's very simple. So for example, if you look at that one, this uh, aluminant, uh, in this case, this drug for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, they said they really, and in the label, uh, the recommended dose is two milligrams once daily. Of course, this is not related with a special population in this case, but overall for every people there, uh, this is this is the dose that should be used. Uh, so this is the same for every, every drug. So sometimes you have more specialized population, sometimes you have less, but this is a bit, a bit simple in, the, in this case. And what we would like to achieve on our side is to take into account uh, different type of properties that are uh, different for individuals. So uh, like alcohol, smoking, nutrition, sports, gender, genetics, weight, age. Uh, of course, not all together, but at least some together to take in, into account these type of things uh, and to see how we can better predict the, the dosing or the, the, the efficacy of the drug or something like that, depending on the different, uh, different situation of the patients, uh, if they are doing sports, if they are nutrition, if they are smoking and so on. So this is really, really the, to have a personalized uh, I would say dosing using uh, a mathematical approach or a model approach for the pharmacokinetics in this case. So uh, if you look into that one, why we want to do it, as I said before, so if you are looking for the drug when they are on the market, uh, this, is a, this is a study that was done in the UK. Uh, so you can see that when they are in the market, there is, of course, a lot of adverse events that are related with, uh, with uh, spending money on the, the hospitals and the and how to treat the patient when they are taking the drugs. Um, and th this is really, really uh, not only about money, of course, of it's costing a lot for the for the, the health insurance and all this stuff and for the for the government, but it's really to see that it could be avoided. Uh, it could be avoided there. It could be avoided because when you look into the, the, the reason why uh, these, these drugs have uh, issues when they are on the market there, most of them have issues not all, but most of them have issues because the dosing was wrong or unclear, uh, or the, fr the the frequency of the dosing was wrong also, and the, the the quantity of the dosing was wrong. So it was not wrong, but it was not matching exactly the characteristic of the patients. So this is this is why this is really important to to try to predict as soon as possible, and also uh, with the data that we have, uh, what could be the impact of uh, the, the the patients. Uh, in this case, so the patient's characteristic in this case. So uh, this is also a wish that uh, you can see at the NHS, in this case in the UK, uh, and also in the World Health Organization, they want to reduce the severe avoidable medication related harm globally by 50% in 2022. So this is really, really uh, something that is a, a kind of strategy for the World Health Organization to reduce these uh, related medication issues. And one of the, the, the solutions that we found there is to see, okay, if we can bring together, um, I would say, exact cure with a, a, a technology that is building PKPD or PK models based on the, the characteristic of the patients with uh, I would say the, the data uh, and how we organize the data within Elsevier and much more within Pharmapendium there, uh, how we organize the data and if we can bring together the models and the data, the large amount of data that we have from regulatory agencies and uh, from also from literature on, on patients and on the different conditions, so co-medications, smoking and all these type of conditions of so PK data, how we can be better to predict uh, the output in terms of uh, personalized medicine or personalized dosing there. That's really, really the goal of the presentation. And so I will le let my colleagues also uh, to discuss a bit what Exactor is doing, what Pharmapenium is, and after you will see three examples. So I think that uh, Fabien, the floor is yours now. Thank you, Olivier. Hello, everybody. What I'm going to do now is I will introduce you 
to the overall solution of uh, exact cure and the product um, as we said we and i want to take it from the the end users point of view because in the real life we have two kinds of users patients and healthcare professionals but then what i'm going to show you now in the next few, few slides can happen only if we have worked together earlier in the process during the clinical trials and this is why we are partnering with uh, with Elsevier. But in the end, what do we want to do at Execure? We want to provide a digital twin that simulates the, the concentration of drugs, of molecules in the blood or the plasma of patients, taking into account their personal characteristics, like age, weight, sex, renal status, genotype, gene mutations. And the goal is really to avoid underdoses overdoses and drug-drug interactions in real life. But to do this and afford the, uh, um, propose this solution to both patients and healthcare professionals, we need to work beforehand together with, uh, for, uh, with Pharmapendium. Uh, for patients, it, it's an app. It's a web app. It's a, app, a mobile app that looks like this. So if, if Jenny is a patient, she takes a drug uh, based on her age and sex and gen and um, kidney status, uh, she can see that she can run a simulation and see that every everything's fine. She, it's all green because she's facing no overdose, no underdose, no drug drug interaction. But now, if she takes another drug containing the same active molecule, but she's not aware of it, either because it's an OTC drug over the counter or because she has two doctors who don't talk to each other or she decides somehow to take another drug because she has a huge pain then her simulation her uh, digital twin will show her that depending on her personal characteristics she is now facing an overdose here at 6 50 pm if she has taken the second pill already and it's too late then at least she knows and she can react to it and if we want she can call her healthcare professional through the app, or we can send an alert to her healthcare professionals. But the best scenario is that she runs the simulation before actually taking the second pill. And then she won't take the second pill, and she will not fall into the statistics that Olivier showed uh, before. From the healthcare professional point of view, we provide a, an online simulator. It's a tool that the healthcare professional can use in order to run simulations and make his own decision. So it's just a tool. We don't recommend anything. We don't um, tell him what to do or her. We just show um, cold results. Here in this scenario, you can see on the top screen, uh, that's uh, on the top uh, chart, that a regular dose for that works for a man, like 75 kilos, 40 years old. For this specific woman, who is 55 years old, 45 kilos, and has a strong hepatic impairment, although she has a normal genotype, we can visually see very quickly that she's over the threshold, she's overexposed, and she has a score of 57% only. And this is due to the fact that she has a very specific, um, here you can see it, um, um, uh, profile. And now the healthcare professional can run simulations depending on her characteristics here, until he reaches this simulation down, having a score of 97.9%, which means the, the dose of the molecule is really within the therapeutic window, which is within the green and the red line. And now he can decide or she can decide that this is the posology she will adopt. And we um, very humbly uh, believe that we bring at Execure three innovations to the world. The first one is a usage innovation. Today, as a patient, if you take a drug, you're blind. You don't know what's going on in your body. It's like driving a car with no dashboard. What we do is we bring a dashboard for drugs that's used both for, by patients and healthcare professionals. The second innovation, which is the core of today's presentation, is what we call metamodeling. We can take information, we mine literature, which is Pharmapendium, provided by Pharmapendium. So we mine tens, hundreds, thousands of articles. What we find into in those articles is biomodeling data, PKPG data, pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic data, mathematical information that we aggregate in one single model 
which we will run later to provide the simulations. And this is the core of what we are showing today. The third um, innovation is our ability then to take into account the feedback of a patient, either declared, like it hurts or I feel bad, or measured through a connected device. And this way we can fine tune the digital twin of this very specific patient, but also we can learn from a population point of view, um, statistical patterns that would not be um, well um, seen otherwise. Uh, I think now, Thomas, I will uh, hand over to you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Fabien. So in Farapanium, we understand exact cure, and we understand that modeling and predictive approaches um, need to be done with the highest quality data possible and data curated by experts. And regulatory documents and scientific literature are a rich and ever-growing source of ADME data on marketed drugs. So in Farapenium, we have the most comprehensive information on FDA and EMA approved drugs. And how do we do this? We extract all the documents from these sources, sometimes going back to 1938. But also from relevant journals, we manually extract this information with a panel of experts, PhDs and medical doctors. And we reorganize this information into expert biomedical taxonomies so they are easily retrievable and searchable. You can have access to all this wealth of information via our intuitive user interface, farapendium.com, or directly you can use this data via API, export files for post-processes if needed. The output is searchable index database all linked to the original source document so you can have more context around the data. We extract this information searchable across drug, class, target, indication, adverse effects. And this data can be used into analytical tools or in-depth data analysis I will show you. <clears throat> so if we go into the DMPK solution in farmpandium.com where we deliver export-ready data from DMPK modeling like PopPK, PopPD or PopPBPK modeling like Fabian just said, from unstructured, undiscoverable data, we display them in a structured, high-quality DMPK and safety data from the entire approval package and full-text literature. And we keep incrementing these curated data. So we have few numbers on the right-hand side. You can see this is, these numbers are incremented on a monthly basis in Farapendium and ever-growing. And this is the data we have given ExactCure for the acute engaged technology for the case is already will present now. So up to you already. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So uh, as you know now, uh, Execure and Healthsevier have partnered and this partnership consists in combining the Pharmapendium knowledge system and Execure's technology to handle pharmacokinetics models and create services for pharmaceutical companies. So our personalized simulations in Execure associated to all the knowledge contained in Pharmapendium will generate lots of new possibilities that I will now illustrate with three scientific use cases. So the first two use cases are going to focus on empowering population PK models with Pharmapendium data. So the first use case is about clozapine. So clozapine, it's an atypical antipsychotic that is derived from dibenzodiazepine. It's actually the only drug that is approved by FDA in the treatment of resistant schizophrenia. So as a reminder, schizophrenia, it's 1% of the world population, which is already 600,000 patients just in France. So what's interesting about clozapine is that uh, it has lots of pharmacokinetics challenges. Uh, first one is its narrow therapeutic range, so between 0.35 and 0.60 milligrams per liter. And second one is all the factors that can influence the concentration of the drug in the body. For example, non-compliance to treatment, which is very common in psychiatry, 
And CIP1A2 and CIP1A4 activity, which is influenced by smoking, by gender, and by genetic polymorphisms. So our simulations can help identify the reasons why patients do not respond to treatment and increase the safety of the drug. So how can we overcome this resistance which, which is associated to treatment failure? Because suboptimal treatment is often associated to underexposure and persistent underexposure is associated to treatment failure. So here we are studying the case of a 30-year-old man uh, with quick schizophrenia who also happens to be a smoker and uh, who's been on high doses of clozapine for a while. Uh, the problem is that this uh, patient is not answering well uh, to, the, to the treatment. We don't see any improvement. So after some tests, doctors identified that he had strong polymorphism on CYP1A2 which means that his cytochrome metabolized way too much clozapine and didn't let time for clozapine to accumulate in the body. And so his concentrations of clozapine in the blood didn't reach the efficacy threshold. So how can our simulation help in this situation? Well, thanks to pharmapendium data, we saw that literature suggests a way of increasing exposure without increasing the dose of clozapine, which could be dangerous. How? By using fluvoxamine as a co-treatment. Fluvoxamine is an inhibitor of CYP1A2. So this will counterbalance the polymorphism, uh, the genetic polymorphism of the patient. So here, you can see it, so by combining our literature population model that we had in exact cure of clozapine and the clozapine fluvoxamine DDI data that are contained in pharmapendium, we could simulate and monitor this process of adding fluvoxamines to clozapine to reach efficacy. And you can see here in blue, that our patient before adding fluvoxamine was above uh, under, sorry, the efficacy threshold, and after adding clugosamine and keeping the same dose of clozapine, our patient was stabilized inside the therapeutic range. So, Exactures algorithms allowed to incorporate this DDI into the base population PK model. And Another application of this is what I'm going to explain in this second use case. So the second use case is about imatinib. So imatinib is a quite famous tyrosine kinase inhibitor, which is mainly used in chronic myeloid leukemia treatment. Um, its uh, pharmacokinetics is mostly influenced by weight and also by genetics, because imatinib is metabolized by, by CYP3A4. Uh, the problem is here, so that we're going to try to predict uh, the pharmacological impact of St. John's wort intake over imatinib exposure. St. John's wort, it's a plant that has been used in traditional European medicine as far back as the ancient Greeks. Now it's a famous dietary supplement with proven antidepressant activity. The problem here is that a third, up to half, of cancer patients use alternative treatments, such as St. John's wort, but they have no idea of how those treatments can impact the real drug they are taking to, to cure their cancer. And here it's quite relevant because St. John's wort is also a strong CYP3A4 inducer. And when St. John's wort will induce this cytochrome, imatinib will be metabolized way too fast and won't be able to accumulate in the blood. Studies have shown that the combination of both can lead to a decrease of efficacy of imatinib that is up to 40%. And this is what we're going to see here on the stimulation. So here we did, as earlier, we used one of our literature population models in Exacture and pharmapendium interaction data to simulate this phenomenon and to really be able to see the impact of this covariate on the blood concentration of imatinib. So here in orange, you can see our patient without St. John's wort. So 
his imatinib is right, he's above therapeutic threshold, everything is fine. But if he's also taking St. John's wort, then he can never stabilize above the therapeutic threshold. And so he's losing the efficacy of his treatment. So once again, Exacure's technology allowed to incorporate inside a base population PK model, pharmapendium data to show these interactions. And furthermore, so here I'm talking about what we call a regular patient. But we can also uh, mix those uh, covariates and simulate some less regular patients. For example, here the case of a nobis patient, so a 40-year-old man, which is 110 kilos. So here you can see on the left the impact of the weight on his treatment. So it doesn't seem that much, but it depends on the cases. Sometimes it's way more important. And here you can see the impact of concomitant St. John's wort on the obese patient. We can also tackle pediatric patients. Here you have the simulations of a child, a 10-year-old child, which is 30 kilos, and which has a different dosage because this dosage is adapted to its weight. And we can see also on this curve the impact of St. John's wort in Greece, in green, sorry, on the imatinib blood concentration of the child. So last use case is a bit different. Um, here it's going to be more about how could we predict uh, some kind of relationship between adverse events and pharmacokinetics drug exposure? So can we link adverse events to pharmacokinetics data? Um, to discuss that, we are going to talk about a very famous molecule, which is amoxicillin. So amoxicillin, it's a beta-lactam antibiotic, which is used to treat bacterial infections. Uh, you already probably know it because it's on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines. And it is one of the most prescribed antibiotics in children. But it's also a drug that comes with some adverse events sometimes. Those adverse events can be nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and others. So using the pharmapendium data, we tried to see if we could predict those adverse events. So first we used what's called the safety data. Those safety data, they confront regime dosage, uh, re uh, dosing regimens to adverse events. For example, all the, doges, all the dosing regimens that resulted in abdominal pain. And we used our internal PK model of amoxicillin to simulate those dosing regimen associated to an adverse event. So here you have the dosing regimen simulated for abdominal pain, and here you have the dosing regimen simulated for vomiting. The first insight when you look at these curves is saying like, if I want to correlate a PK observate to this adverse event, well, here, I would rather think that it's the peak concentration that can be correlated. And on the right, I would rather think that it's the AUC that could be correlated. But how to confirm that? Well, by formatting and adding the FAIRS data plus the safety data and simulate 1,000 generated patients to bring personalization. Because in those new data, we have now the personalized information on each patient, so is covariate, so we can simulate his own curve. And from those curves, extract PK observates and try to feed machine learning algorithms. So here, it's quite working because uh, our first intuition is quite good because, for example, you see for vomiting, uh, when we try to feed machine learning by learning from peak concentration only, we see that the prediction is not, not good. But when we try learning from AUC, then we see that we're improving the prediction. So the, the summary of this is that safety assessment is another collaboration topic between us. And the goal here is to be able to use those Elsevier patient data, so which I can remind is reporting dosing regimen 
Asian covariates and reported side effects, use the data to simulate with our internal technology in Exacure, extract PK exposure descriptors, correlate them to the side effects, and then feed some machine learning algorithms that will allow to anticipate adverse events during a clinical trial and after in real life. Uh, and uh, I think it's Thomas after. Yes. Thank you, Aurélie. So, with Exact Cure Disruptive Software Solution for Predictive PK Models and Farmpanium Most Comprehensive Regulatory Content and its depth, data depth, we ambition to create an, a synergy and to deliver the best-in-class predictive personalized dosing solutions for optimal drug safety and efficacy. So you can better mitigate risk for clinical trials with a better risk-benefit assessment to avoid late-stage failure. Now, as a conclusion, uh, of course, like if you are pharma professionals, the MPK specialists, clinical pharmacologists, and so on, or healthcare professionals, we are developing a you are developing a new drug, repurposing or assessing an already approved drug, with maybe a potentially narrow therapeutic window with a drug or food interaction, and you need to tailor made those regimen to maximize therapeutic efficacy and minimize the drug toxicity for a specific patient. We would like to hear from you because Pharmapendium and Exacture can support you with all the, the, the use cases that we presented. And of course, this is not an exhaustive list of use cases that I just show you. So please, we would love to hear from you. We, we would love to hear your feedback. So you can contact us at Elzevier, Olivier Baboran at Elzevier.com or Exacture at Fabien Astic at F.Astic at Exacture.com. We would love to hear from you, of course. And again, we would like to promote the upcoming DMPK uh, webinar that we have with our partner and Elzevier, Pierre Fabre, which is coming on the 27th of October at 4 p.m. The title is Model-Based Strategy to Guide the Choice of Clinical Doses for Antibody Drug Conjugates. So I engage everyone here to uh, tune in on the 27th of October for this great webinar coming with Olivier Barbaran and Julie derivo kennel and we would like to thank all the panelists and also all the participants and Elizabeth for coordinating this webinar. Thank you, everyone. And please, we have the QA session now. Feel free to send us your questions, your feedback, your comments, and don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you. Okay, so we have some questions. So, um, so let's see uh, the one that we have on the on the chat. So uh, I have a question. I think this is a question for exact cure people there. To what extent is your solution an out of the box solution? As a patient, can I just download the app and start working with it? So Fabien or, or Frederic? Okay, I'll start. I'll start with that one, and then Frederic uh, will will take the more technical ones. As a patient, you can download the app once it's on the market, once it's available, which is not the case right now, today. It will be available for chronic patients suffering from rheumat uh, chronic rheumatisms and uh, patients having to manage their pain in uh, around March 2021. And that will be available in French and English. But of course, we recommend that you work hand in hand with your healthcare professional. So we also have the healthcare professional uh, simulator that you've seen above. And uh, if you're a patient, you can use uh, the, the, the Digital Twin app on your own, but you can also um, recommend the simulator to your healthcare professional. And this way you can create a link between you two and you can get a remote and real time uh, monitoring from your healthcare professionals. So Q1 to NT21 for a specific chronic disease, and then we will add chronic disease, other chronic diseases, other indications over time. Okay, so the, the next one is about the business model of uh, this type of approach. So what are we providing? What is your typical operational model, business model? Are you acting like a CROs or research partners? Or are you offering services like SaaS or content as a service? 
so uh, I can answer that one if you want, guys. Uh, so at least on the on the collaboration part that we discussed today, this is a kind of everything is open, I would say, because this is a service that we are providing to customers. So the service right now, it's to support your PK modeling uh, for dosing or patients and so on, using uh, the technology of Exactcure and the content of Elsevier. So we are really open to, to discuss with you, is it a partnership that we want to do? Uh, is it a, a kind of zero that we want to, uh, to achieve? So a services agreement? Everything is on the table right now. So this is, uh, we are starting to work on that one. Uh, we would like to see uh, with this webinar if it was a, a good idea to work in this way. So this is, we, we are really testing the market right now. So everything that is uh, useful for you uh, will be treated on our side. And uh, this is uh, really a, an open question that uh, that we can uh, that we can answer. At the, and for Exacture itself, I think that uh, Fred, uh, if you want to answer on that one, Frederick, uh, to see, if you are working as a CEO company or if you are working as a research partners, uh, do you have any insight about that in your side? On your side? Yeah, thank you, Olivia. Yeah, cl clearly, the vision is that we are we are not a CRO, but we uh, we want to be partners on specific projects, especially with pharma companies. Very clearly, but you you explain it very well. I think there is a, a beautiful synergy that we can have together, and uh, we could bring it to to pharma customers clearly. Okay, thanks, Frederick from uh, Exactcure. So, I have a there is another question. Can you combine your own not published so far research data with the content in uh, Compendium? I think it was from Appendium on that one. So, Frederick or, or Fabian, do you want to answer to that one? I will put some comment afterwards. I think. On this yeah, one. I, I can I can take it if you want, but maybe already you can comment us also if if you want. But uh, the idea is that all the things we do in this presentation is based on public data. Uh, um, on publication mainly. So the, the basis of our work is to, to leverage different types of uh, sources from the literature, from different clinical trials, and to, to bring something new to federate them and integrate them into uh, what we call a meta model. This is what, what we presented. So yes and no. So, so no, we don't uh, use, uh, uh, let's say, other sources of data for the moment, but yes, if you are a pharma company, for example, and you have your own private data, then we can integrate those private data, not already published data, into meta modeling. So the answer is yes and no. Finally. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Frederick, on that one. Uh, yeah. Ju just a, a reminder on the on the content that is uh, within within Pharmapendium on that one. So uh, the content that we have there are, that we are extracting, uh, it's not a private content right now so we have we don't have specific data uh, what we are using right now it's the data that are coming from uh, regulatory content we have some content that are not really available or really uh, readily available there are, this is the content that is coming from the FDA so not the one that you can see on the FDA website but uh, as Thomas said before we are starting from 1938 and uh, this content is only available in the microfiche uh, that are in the FDA and we have a special agreement with the FDA for extracting this content from there. So this is, uh, it's not a private one, but this is a, a type of content that is uh, pretty difficult to uh, to reach. And this is something that, uh, that can be available in, in Pharmapendium. And also the, we have also some other content that are publicly available, but that are pretty difficult to find. This is the advisory a committee document that are uh, published or that are publicly available but that are not really reachable by the uh, by the, the different people there and these type of advisory uh, document are also available within uh, within pharma opinion uh, and they are searchable and also the data are extracted uh, another questions that uh, that is popping up right now uh, yeah, maybe the last one is for you maybe and um, uh, so the last one is interesting one uh, yes. uh, one of the, the advantages of for a pharma company to leverage public data from Elsevier when developing an innovative drug. Yeah, so uh, the, the the goal there, of course, uh, the I know what you what you are understanding uh, asking this question. Of course, we are we are not displaying or we are not disclosing the data that you are working on when you are developing a drug in your pharma companies. But when you are when you are developing a drug in your pharma companies, most of the time you are not developing a drug. I would say alone. So you are developing a drug within a kind of therapeutic class, within a kind of uh, uh, drug class or whatever, or uh, indication or for an indication also. And so uh, what we provide on our side, it's a kind of uh, uh, 
historical data about what was already uh, published, uh, what was already approved by the by the regulatory agencies on these the other drugs that are in the same indication, the drugs that are in the same class, how the people react in the family, in the regulatory agencies when this drug was submitted to the to the the, the reviewers. How the what are the questions that the, the people ask for this uh, this type of of, uh, of drug that are not exactly your drug, of course, but that are close to your drug in terms of drug class or in terms of indication or in terms of uh, properties also. What I can expect in terms of adverse event, uh, what I can expect in terms of uh, ADME properties, PK properties, uh, what are the clinical trials that were done in, in, on this indication on a drug that are for which I am competing with, if, uh, if you are not the first in uh, the, the, the first on the market. Uh, so there is, of, of course, this is historical data to help you to uh, manage the future of the new drugs that you are developing. So this is, you don't, you have to learn from the past to build the future. So this is a bit what Pharma Peno is doing right now on the on the drug development side. Maybe an additional comment on that. Uh, the the technical the technological brick we are describing today is going a bit further in, because we we can imagine that okay you you can you can uh, browse raw data in pharmapendium but what we propose today is to play dynamically play with the with the drug that you are interested in you can simulate a new dose regimen different doses let's say and uh, and integrate also in, uh, drug interactions and uh, and uh, cofactors and you can really dynamically play with this uh, historical data and another comment is that uh, all innovative drugs are not really new drugs. When you are thinking about repositioning an old drug in a new indication, and we've seen that a lot, you know, um, in the context of COVID-19, you can think about uh, creating um, a meta model that would be the, this meta model would be the result of the integration of all the historical data on this drug you're interested in for a new indication. And then to, to start uh, imagine well to, to start to imagine uh, how this drug could tra could transpose in your own indication, maybe at a different dose, at a different drug regimen for this new uh, indication you are you are looking for. So my vision, sorry, but to conclude, my vision on that, ideally, uh, in this context of repositioning, would be to build uh, a first meta model based on uh, from appendium data and based on on executable technology, and this uh, meta model could be the first break of a future companion model that would be uh, uh, launched together with your future drug. This is the vision. Okay, so there is another one. Uh, let me read this one there. Uh, those, are, those are questions. Uh, there are many ones. <laughs> yeah. I have one if you want. But in, in okay. thing here. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, based on the factors you just mentioned, what are the factors that most dramatically influence dosing? Uh, genetics, smoking, organ impairment? Maybe already you want to, to comment on that, but- Yeah, uh, I can. Well, let's go uh, that. Well, actually, this really depends on the drug. For example, genetics will have much more of an impact if the drug is metabolized by the liver, by some cytochromes. And uh, for some other molecules that are not metabolized, maybe then the weight will have more impact. So it's quite drug specific. Yes, exactly. And um, well, when you start uh, the exact application, there are mandatory questions that we ask to patients. That this this, are, this is linked to the main influencers of a give of of the drugs. And they are weight, age, gender, uh, renal status, key context of uh, more complex uh, pathologies in oncology, for example. Very often now we, we, we can investigate genetics. So in this context, genetics could be integrated. But maybe we could also dream of a, of a world in, I don't know, two, three, four years where every patient will have his own genetic data uh, available for health professionals. And also in terms of modeling, I think it is clear to everyone by now that um, we can only model or integrate in our meta model what we can find in Pharmapendium's literature. So if maybe, I don't know, CP3A4 has a big influence on drug X, but there is no literature about it, then 
we cannot do anything about it. We will not invent anything. But if you think, say, on what Olivier just said, that you want to invent a new drug, but you know, thanks to Pharmapendium, that there has been work done in the past on some very similar drug, and you want to integrate this knowledge into your uh, R&D, your research about this new drug, then you can use exact your technology to focus on a specific uh, variable, covariable influencer, like uh, C3A4 mutation, for your new drug. And here we reach a, sta a state where we don't have the literature, but we know and you know that there might, there's a high chance that there is an impact of this variable, then you will run a clinical trial uh, that's very specific to the influence of this variable on this drug, and together we can build what's uh, the, the meta model, the digital twin for this drug. And then once on the market, you will have a great um, product, which is not only the molecule, but which is the molecule plus its digital companion that will be much better um, monitored, of the effect of which will be much better monitored on the population. Okay, so I think that uh, there is uh, no more questions, or there is one more. Yeah, there, there is one more on OTC drugs, I think. Uh, over yes, the there drugs. is one. Yes, yes. There, were like, there were like a question about like over-the-counter drugs. Um, usually over-the-counter drugs are approved by the FDA, so we should have the, the, the data in front of them. Not, not all. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> not, not all the OTCs are, are, are in RPM. Some are, but not all the OTCs for sure. So there is another one I think that uh, that I saw at the beginning. Oh, this is a, a tricky one. Normally, SIP status or polymorphism is not commonly determined in patients. Where do you get this data from? So I think that you have answered a bit, uh, yeah. uh, Fabien, right? Yeah, yeah, I've talked about that. Uh, it's Frederick. I, I talked oh, Frederick. About, about that. Yes, uh, th that's true. That in common practice, you don't uh, screen genetics systematically on patients. But of course, it depends on, on the drug. Uh, if you treat someone with ibuprofen or with uh, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, then <laughs> it's a different story. So the, in oncology, uh, we have more and more often we are, we can see the genetic information. Of course, it's not systematic, but more and more, and maybe in several years, it will be systematic. Okay. Uh, and Olivier, uh, I think there is a comment from Pooja uh, regarding a previous, uh, your previous answer. Oh yeah, about the, the, the published data in literature labels. Yeah, so, the, the, so most of what we have available, or what is really available everywhere, uh, this is the labels of the the drugs, so you can find it in Delimed, you can find it everywhere. Uh, what we are doing in, in Pharmapium, this is, uh, we are going beyond the labels, I would say, so we are extracting the data from uh, the FDA package, and this is where we found also uh, more detailed data about uh, the, 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 the phenotyping, the, the phenotype of the, 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 the people there, the phenotype of the, uh, of the, ex the experiment based on the phenotyping uh, for for determining the, the 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 metabolism of the drug and so on, so we are going beyond the, the doubles and we extract this data to populate the uh, the PK what we call the PK modules or the metabolism modules there that we have for transporters and enzymes, and this is mainly the data that we are that we have provided to Exactio to build uh, to build the model at the end. So this is not just the, the few data that you can find in the labels, but this is also all the the experiment that are well detailed into the the the, the packages, the approval packages that you can find. And for the, the, the MEA, uh, this is uh, the EPAR that we are providing, not also the, the not only the labels, but uh, also the EPAR section where you have more detailed uh, results on that one. And uh, something that is also very interesting to just to come back to what uh, what we that uh, the question that we had before, where we said, okay, how we can how come how pharmapenium can help to to build a new uh, a new future or new drug. First of all, we are partnering with Exacture on that one to have a, a kind of model building approach uh, for PK and so on. So this is one of the the I would say the strategy that we have at Elsevier for pharmapenium. It's really to move from a data as a service to um, a solution that we can provide to uh, our customers that will include, uh, I would say, 
PK modeling and not only PK modeling, but uh, modeling in general. Uh, and the, the, the goal there is really to take into account all the data that we have uh, that we have on, on our side. And uh, these data are coming from, as I said, from the, the packages, uh, the labels, and also from the DAISY documents, uh, and also from um, regulatory uh, regulatory documents to the, the, uh, the advisory committees where the the, the people are uh, from the regulatory agencies are discussing uh, if the the, the, the the drug was submitted correctly, if data are missing, and so on. So this is also very interesting to see how the the the, pharma, the, the, the regulatory agencies are reacting when the drug is submitted to the uh, to their uh, their side. I would say. And just to comment on what you said, I think this is where we have a fantastic synergy. I think because you are uh, um, well, you have great data. You have plenty of data from regulatory regulatory sources, from uh, from clinical trials, from uh, literature, of course. And um, it's a bit uh, maybe this uh, ocean of data of data is maybe maybe too big for a human brain. I would say and. Uh, um, what is interesting is in, in what we are presenting today is that we quantitative, quantitatively integrate uh, those different sources of data in a, in a simulation that is quite simple to visualize, in fact, uh, in, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of pharmacology, of course. So the, this is what the synergy is, I think. The, we, we, we put uh, another scientific layer, modeling layer, on your fantastic data layer, and this is uh more digest i would say for for human being to to to, to see that and okay. and even to quantitatively integrate that which is impossible without uh specific algorithms okay so uh any other comments so i don't think so that we have more questions on the list right now uh, Maybe there, there was one one we missed i, 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 uh, missed. I, I missed one uh, yes uh, a question about the the amount of uh, of uh, of uh, patients we need it's a bit oh, yeah. Tricky because uh, the minimum minimum amount of patient uh, you need for accurate meaningful predictions. Actually, we don't. You understood that we don't uh, directly take um, we don't really directly take patient data. We 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 integrate different clinical trials and very simply to have a meaningful prediction, we need meaningful a meaningful trial. And uh, and of course, the number of patients in each trial depends on the drug itself. If you have and depends on the variability of the drug itself. If you have very acute, uh, let's say, uh, measurements, uh, no variability between patients, maybe 10 patients could be enough. But if you have, if you have a lot of variability, a lot of uh, inter-individual variability, then you, can, you, you, you could need 100, 200, 1,000 patients per study, depending on the drug itself. So there is no universal rule. The, um, but what we do is that we, we Take into account this basic material uh, of of clinical data to uh, to do meaningful prediction, and of course we have to, to we have to do a curation on those data to select the the, the most relevant ones. Another comment, maybe uh, we said at some point that the goal of all this is in the end to help healthcare professionals and patients in real life to properly use drugs. But if we limit our expectations to just the clinical trials, and if you as a pharmaceutical company are asking yourself, okay, what's my interest now regarding uh, approval, FDA approval or EMA approval? There is an interest right here because thanks to our combined value, you can reduce the attrition rate of of your of your trials meaning you can increase the chance of getting actually getting market approval because thanks to this modeling meta modeling based on the literature um if you have um modeled um, literature or information that uh, regarding a, um, a molecule that is uh, very similar to yours then you can better we can help you better or spot outliers very early during clinical trials before they jeopardize your clinical trials and also we can provide um uh, what uh, kind of, of a nipro so it's a remote monitoring in real time of your cohort of patients and you can correlate for the first time in history and that's why it's very unique here what you're hearing you can correlate the 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 effect of a drug to its plasmatic or blood concentration in real time remotely thanks to our combined technology. And this you won't find anywhere else. Uh, what you describe is really the vision of, of a companion model. 
that would be established from the clinical trial and already on the, until the, the market approval and uh, in phase four after that. Really, this is the, the vision we can bring uh, together. Okay, thanks, uh, Frédéric and, and, uh, and Fabien. Thanks so if we have no more questions, I think that we are reaching the end of this uh, this webinar. So I would like to thank you all, uh, Fabien, uh, Aurélie, and uh, Frédéric from uh, Exactura, Thomas, myself uh, from Elsevier, and also from uh, Elisabeth from CHI to, uh, uh, to build this uh, beautiful webinar. So if we are missed some questions, uh, I don't think so, but uh, in this case, we'll answer by uh, uh, by email uh, to these guys. Uh, of course, yes, we can share the, the slide deck with you guys, uh, and I think that they will be also. Uh, you will receive a kind of recording from the from uh, Elizabeth, uh, as, as she said at the beginning. So, thanks you all. Uh, it was great to spend one hour with you guys, and uh, hope so that we can see you next time. <laughs>